Yeah, my talk's uh, entitled Strange Creeds on the Antipodean uh, UFO Trail, and basically I've been investigating UFOs for far longer than I probably care to remember, but uh, in my travels all the way around Australia, I've, I constantly keep bumping into uh, accounts and stories of uh, strange creatures, you know, your typical sort of Yowie reports, that kind of thing, and uh, uh, wherever possible I try to investigate these and pass these on to people like Paul and Rex Gore and others and that kind of thing. So. Uh, it's just part of this informal sort of network that operates Australia-wide. Um, just a bit about myself, very quickly, um, but part of the old commercial... Want to go on to the next slide? Sorry. Next slide? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but, uh, just to give you an idea, um, for those who are interested in the, in the subject, the UFOs in particular, um, I've got a few copies of my book, The Oz Files, there, which is essentially just a history of what's happened uh, in the subject in Australia, and also includes a, a bit of a brief account of... Uh, the story that I'll be describing in a little bit of detail for you today um, with regard to events that occurred back at, uh, in northern New South Wales way back in 1927. Uh, so those of you are interested, uh, by all means, get a copy of the book. Uh, I, I've been involved with this subject for quite some time. Um, I come at it from a bit of a science background. Um, uh, I try to uh, have the discipline of sort of a fairly sceptical sort of investigation into this on the basis that whatever survives that sceptical gauntlet might be worthwhile looking at. And uh, so that's just generally been my approach over the years. Uh, some of the cases I've come across really strain uh, that sort of uh, critical gauntlet from time to time, and um, some of them are, are quite bizarre. And uh, the story I'll be talking to you today is, is one of those. Nick? Um, yeah, this is where you're going to have to imagine part of it. Um, back in about 1980, a colleague of mine, Mark Morovic, here in Australia, uh, put together what uh, what was referred to as a UFO antipoid catalogue in which he sort of listed 75 cases worldwide of events that seem to involve creatures that, I guess, for want of a better word, resemble Bigfoot, Yowie, that kind of thing, and uh, events that involve sightings of those sorts of creatures in association with, with UFOs. And uh, uh, out of those 75 cases, uh, and there were a number of overseas cases, particularly in America, that seemed to suggest a very strong correlation, but... Uh, Overall, the five cases that came from Australia were pretty weak and marginal in, t in terms of the, uh, the actual um, UFO connection, and uh, I generally tend to feel that uh, most of these cases are pretty marginal in terms of the possible UFO connection. In fact, probably with the next slide, uh, some are, well, sort of, yeah, whatever explanation is, is likely for mystery animals, uh, the least likely explanation is that they're UFO related, uh, but there are a few notable exceptions, and. Uh, that's really the rule of thumb here. I, I think uh, UFOs, if there are such things, are uh, uh, carrying around a zoological zoo and dumping Bigfoot, Yowie, or uh, thylacines or whatever. Uh, basically, th there are a few reports that, that are of interest, um, but they're more the exception than the rule. Next. So, what I'm going to try and focus on is this story. Um, uh, I first heard about it in, in about 1984, and. Um, I tried to chase it up. I eventually got a name of a person uh, who was purported to be the witness. Uh, I wrote off to the address that I was given and uh, nothing happened for about a year. And then all of, out of the blue uh, came a, uh, a long 20-page um, letter or thereabouts, uh, which this guy had been sort of writing for, for over a year, putting down his recollections of events that had occurred um, way back in 1927 at a locality near Moolumbar up on the north coast, uh, back in 1927. And what it evolved, involved essentially was uh, sightings of UFOs, uh, UFO landing, uh, sightings of big bird type creatures, uh, not just sesame seed variety. They're, these are uh, things that are, uh, were large, sort of uh, extraordinary looking creatures and uh, strange entities, C cattle and cow mutilation events um, and pigs uh, being mutilated um, uh, and stories of strange men. All the ingredients of some of the more apocryphal elements of the, uh, the UFO law yet it occurred back in 1927, uh, 20, a full 20 years before um, the beginning of the modern flying saucer era in 1947. And uh, uh, when I first heard this story, I, I, I thought this guy must have read a, a particular uh, favourite book of mine uh, called The Mothman Prophecies and uh, uh, because it was like a, a complete rerun of the, of the Mothman Prophecy story. And... Uh, uh, and yet it occurred 40 years before that. Um, uh, I'll mention the Mothman prophecy a little later, but uh, it, it's going to be, for those who are uh, curious about it, um, it's being made into a film which will probably come out early next year with Richard Gere in the starring role. Um, and it, it tells a pretty bizarre story. And uh, basically the story that you'll get, hopefully, if Hollywood hasn't sort of mutilated the story too much, um, 
you'll, you'll get a story like I'm going to tell you now, but 40 years later, essentially, that's what it's about. Um, next. This is a part of the letter uh, that um, Cecil McGann wrote to me. Um, uh, now, he was describing events that uh, he recollected that occurred uh, involved his family when he was about the age of 10 in 1927. Uh, next. Um, I was fortunate enough to, that I didn't just have to rely on Cecil's story. Um, uh, his sister was still alive as well, and she was a witness to part of this as well. And subsequently, uh, more recently, I've spoken to uh, other uh, local people who were children who were also uh, fellow school students with this fellow, and they all support his credibility and all remembered that uh, this story did occur and they recollected it as kids. Um, so that's important from the point of view of establishing that it's not a, a recent hoax. And, uh, Having had the opportunity to listen to Cecil um, from about 1985 onwards, um, and I've spoke to him in person for the first time in about 1987, and I've spoken to him many times since then and interviewed him on video, and if we've got a little bit of time, I'll show you a of that video that I did quite recently. Uh, and uh, this is a painting at the top here that uh, his sister uh, Dorothy did that shows you the location. You know, you're talking about fairly big sort of rolling hills, really uh, lovely sort of area. It's mainly a sort of a dairy farming area, has been for many, many decades. And uh, at that time, at the end of the 20s, it was essentially a, a fairly uh, Spartan sort of area. People sort of eked out a fairly uh, Spartan existence. Um, and these people were part of a, a family that were share farming a property that was owned by somebody else. And, uh, uh, and so it was sort of a pretty harsh lifestyle, but at the same time, uh, uh, a fairly uh, nice sort of lifestyle in the sense of... Uh, uh, back to nature and all that kind of thing. You can just see in these photographs, there's an early photograph that actually was taken from pretty much the same perspective there, um, showing the, the house. Uh, next. Uh, and this is at least part of the house uh, that you can see. Um, and, uh, and it was at this location, and to give you a bit of a bearing, uh, that location was uh, really about um, only a couple of kilometres from the um, Pacific Highway, and uh, going up there this year to try and relocate the actual area, I was really quite astounded as to how close it was to the Pacific Highway, but you have to realise that the Pacific Highway has actually moved about three or four times in the space of the time since 1927. But at that time, or even now when you drive off the road, if I didn't have a local guide to locate the place for me, I never would have found it. It's, it's pretty isolated. Next. Uh, this is um, uh, Tom and Sarah McGann, um, Cecil's parents. Uh, next slide. Uh, and these are a couple of. Whoops. I'll go back one. I lost it. There we go. Yeah. Uh, Cecil was a kid, uh, a little bit younger than ten. But these are some of the only photographs I was able to get of Cecil around about that time. He's about age six there, in a little police cosy there. And uh, below is Cecil as he is now. Um, he's aged about 83 now. They're about 83, 84. Um, and as I said, I've spoken to him on numerous occasions, and I've had plenty of opportunity to listen to how consistent the story is. And the story in terms of content is very consistent. Uh, he does tend to uh, change his mind about the sequence of events, etc. And as you can imagine, if you're trying to remember something that happened so long ago, uh, I think that's a fairly reasonable expectation of uh, somebody who's telling a story. Basically, all these events he's certain of occurred in a very narrow frame of time. We're talking about a week, two or three weeks um, in one year in 1927. Uh, so... Uh, it was a very confined period of time. Next. Uh, this is taken from a video that I took on the property, which just shows you the look of the property right now. Um, it's pretty much overgrown, fairly run down now. Um, and, uh, but fortunately, at the time, I had the guide of uh, uh, Barry Roach, who, in fact, uh, was uh, a member of the family that went onto the property immediately after the McGanns left the property in the early 30s. Um, and Barry, uh, who's in his uh, mid-70s, took me onto the property. In fact, he went to school. In those days, it was only a, uh, a one-room school where uh, the school consisted of anybody from infant school right up to sixth form high school, basically, were all in the same classroom being taught by one teacher. Could have been a pretty dynamic sort of teacher, I would think. Uh, but he, he remembered the story. Um, he remembered that a number of the locals remembered some of these features and some of these stories. And they all, they all spoke highly of Cecil. Uh, next. Uh, that's Barry Roach um, using a photograph.